Um, I'll turn it over to Brian Bird, who actually comes to us from the University of Nevada. All right. Like you said, my name is Brian. I'm a visiting student from the University of Nevada, Reno. Um, knowing I'd be five out of six here, I thought we could use a little battle cry of enthusiasm here. So with a little help from Tina, I found this picture here. Just like shows the excitement that I thought we might need here. So I want to go ahead. The case I want to share with you guys today starts with a 36-year-old Caucasian female. She came into our clinic just uh, requesting a checkup. Um, as we worked through her history, it was pretty non-contributory there. And then uh, her workup was that of a healthy 36-year-old Caucasian female. And so as we moved along through the uh, as we moved along through the examination, we started our slit lamp exam, and we found this finding right there on the cornea there, and uh, I want to give everyone a chance to just kind of look at that and think to themselves what that might be. I want this called as a posterior embryo toxome. And so it's associated with other, uh, uh, with other congenital, congenital defects. And so we went through the rest of the exam, we found that it was quite normal. But uh, because of that finding of posterior embryo toxome, we went ahead, we went ahead and uh, did a gonioscopy. And we found, if you can see that image right there, we found these uh, broad-based peripheral anterior synechiae that were scattered throughout the eye as well. And then going through the back of the eye was pretty, uh, um, pretty normal as well. So if you think to yourself, all right, posterior embryo toxin plus these PAS, what, uh, what could be the diagnosis for that? And so you can think to yourself, a few of them, I've listed a few up here. And as uh, it says on the, on the list right there, axonfield anomaly was actually the diagnosis for our patient here. And so Axenfeld anomaly is part of a bigger spectrum of syndromes, the axenfeld rager syndrome. Basically, it's a spectrum of disorders that are differentiated based on the extent of clinical findings you have, um, Axenfeld anomaly being the most benign of those. And so uh, these are caused by defective neural crest cell-related processes during fetal uh, development. It's uh, most commonly inherited in autosomal dominant fashion um, related to the genes PITX2, PAX6, FOXC1, and RIEG2, among others that we're studying right now because of the advent of genetic sequencing methods. Um, the reason this is so important is because it imparts a 50% risk of developing glaucoma. So that's why we want to identify these patients and start with treatment. Um, because it is congenital, it's most commonly diagnosed in infancy or early childhood, but really it takes a few years for that glaucoma to develop. So to kind of dig into the spectrum a little bit, I thought it'd be helpful to go ahead and parse each of them out. Starting with most benign, we've got the axon-filled anomaly. Again, that's that posterior embryo toxone, um, in addition to that, uh, that iridocorio stranding there. Um, it's, when you see this, uh, I thought it would be important to talk a little bit about posterior embryo toxin, simply because it's found in a lot of the people in the population. Some papers were claiming estimates about 15%. I found probably the best estimate was found in a Nature paper back in 2004. It took about 700 patients and found that the prevalence was about 7%. And so, again, it's, it's innocuous in most of these people, but it can be associated to more severe uh, syndromes, including axonfield rager syndrome and others. So as we move up in severity, um, additional malformations, so with axonfield anomaly plus iris and pupil anomalies, um, we call that Riger anomaly. And so with additional malformations, we can see now that the patients will have additional symptoms. And so because of this iris and pupil defect, defects, um, patients might start complaining about photophobia and glare problems as well. And then uh, the, most, the most severe end of the spectrum here is the full-blown axonfield Riger syndrome. So this is a Riger anomaly. And in addition to that, now we're also seeing extraocular malformations. Again, keep in mind that uh, these mutations are caused in uh, Neural crest cell um, related neural crest cell related genes, and so these are often transcription factors with really large downstream effects. And so you can see these effects throughout the entire body wherever neural crest cells are involved. Most commonly, they are uh, the maxillofacial abnormalities. You can see in this image there that was actually taken from a case study. That patient only had 23 teeth instead of the normal, which is 32. And then you can see some of the other abnormalities that are listed there. Um, one I thought was actually kind of interesting as I was doing some reading is that this uh, excess periumbilical skin is oftentimes misdiagnosed as a hernia or just a, an Audi belly button. So it actually might be more significant of finding than that. Um, so the control, uh, the management of these patients focuses on the glaucoma itself. And so just like any patient with glaucoma, we want to go ahead and start with medical options using drops. 
And then, uh, however, most patients aren't able to control the uh, glaucoma based on the eye drops alone. And so that's when we moved to surgical treatment. I thought it was important to understand that because of the uh, angle dysgenesis, we actually see that the trabeculotomy and the goniotomy surgery are less effective in these patients. And so they're just historically more difficult to control. So most of these patients on average require about one and a half surgeries per eye, eventually to get the glaucoma under control. Um, other considerations that are important to make when you're managing these patients, um, again, is those uh, iris and pupillary defects can cause that photophobia and glare. And so as we're managing the glaucoma, managing these patients in their syndrome, we can think about getting them these pain and prosthetic contact lenses, which not only can help with the photophobia and glare, but in addition, it has that aesthetic benefit, you know, that the patients are obviously interested in. Um, additionally, to kind of tie it all back to that case of the lady that came into our clinic, um, this is an autosomal dominant um, disease with complete penetrance. And so you need to uh, monitor the kids and family. This lady actually had two kids, and in classic autosomal dominant fashion, one of them did have the syndrome as well. And so these people and these patients will need lifetime monitoring, so we can go ahead and stay on top of that disease. So looking at kind of what's next, so this uh, originally this um, anomaly was first described in 1920, so if we're creeping up on the 100-year anniversary of this syndrome. So we've come a long way, as you'd expect and as you'd hope. And so mostly what we're seeing right now is actually we're seeing that more uh, genes are being identified and we're getting a better understanding of these genes. We have just so many um, genetic sequencing technologies that are disposal now that we're actually learning quite a lot about it. And additionally, I thought the second paper was really interesting actually showed that FOXC1, which is associated in the syndrome, actually um, has been associated with reduced optic nerve size and cell number of the retinal ganglion cell layer. This is independent of the glaucoma damage. So just the mutation itself will actually show some of this uh, decreased number in the retinal ganglion cell layer. And so we're learning a lot about the disease, and with more understanding comes better treatment options. And so <clears throat> just a quick list of my references and a big thank you to the physicians who helped me out. And for being able to do this rotation here at the program. Thanks, guys.